Hello everyone, welcome back. So management part of a maxillary facial patient starts with main first two topics that is the emergence treatment and the preliminary examination. So about the preliminary examination, I've already covered now starting off with the emergency treatment. So what is the importance of ABCs for a maxillofacial trauma patient? So the patient with maxillofacial injuries, they may be having some other bodily injuries which may constitute an actual threat to the life or it is of a higher priority than the facial trauma. It is therefore always necessary to make a rapid assessment of such patients and this starts with the emergency treatment. So what is this primary survey? So during the rapid primary survey, the life-threatening conditions, they are recognized and they are treated without the delay. So they are summarized by this ABCs. So this is the assessment that is from A to I. So A is for airway, B is for breathing, C is for circulation, D is for disability. And this disability, it has this Glasgow Coma Scale, which I have already covered in the last video for that preliminary examination. Then E is for examining, F is for paranoid, G is for get vital, H is for head to toe assessment and I is for intervention. So I'm going to explain about this A, B, C, D and E. Paranite is just you're going to check the temperature. G is for you going to see all the vitals of the patient that is the blood pressure. Then the another like other vitals that are the pulse. Then respiratory rate. Then you're going to check all these vitals and then you're going to do head to toe assessment of that patient and then you're going to intervene it. Starting with the first one that is the airway with the cervical spine control. The maxillofacial injury, they compromise the airway due to, so there can be the reason in which the airway is compromised, it is due to the obstruction of the nasal and the oral airways by the blood clot, saliva, bone, teeth and the parts of the denture. So the airway, it is obstructed because of any of this reason. Then the second is inhalation of any of the above. If you are inhaling any of this materials, like if there is teeth, bone or a part of a denture or if the blood clot, saliva, it is inhaled, then it can cause airway obstruction. Then the obstruction of the nasopharynx and the oropharynx by the backward displacement of the tongue and its attachment as in the symphysial fracture of the mandible. So in the case of if there is a symphysial fracture of the mandible, there is this posterior displacement, backward displacement of the tongue. Because of that, there is obstruction to the nasopharynx and the oropharynx. If there is soft tissue edema of the face, as you have seen in the leaf force, I have already covered about the clinical features of the leaf force. So in that you will see there is soft tissue edema of the face. Then the next reason can be occlusion of the oronasopharynx by the downward and the backward displacement of the fractured maxilla. So these all can lead to the airway obstruction. The airway management can be summarized as first you are going to recognize whatever the obstruction, the airway obstruction is. Then you are going to position the patient in a semi prone with his head which is slightly in a lowered position. Then clear the nose and the oral cavity by suctioning. Then you can give nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal tube. If the cause for the obstruction is because of the backward displacement of the tongue, then the tongue it should be pulled out and the jaw thrusting it should be done. Then endotracheal intubation it is done in the patient who is unconscious. Cricothyrotomy, tracheostomy, then oxygen administration or artificial ventilation is done. So these all are the airway management. So the primary aim of the airway management is to achieve maximum oxygenation of the tissues. So if the airway is compromised, Attempts are made to get a patent airway which includes it includes a chin lift or a jaw thrusting maneuver and removal of all or any of the foreign debris. It is important to recognize the risk of the cervical spine injury and to prevent any movement of the cervical spine while you are attempting to achieve a patent airway. Therefore, the patient's head and neck it should not be hyper extended or hyper flexed to establish or to maintain an airway. So it is better to assume. A cervical spine injury in any patient especially with a blunt injury about the clavicles the next is if the airway obstruction it is due to the displaced and impacted fracture maxilla then restoration of its normal position it can be carried out by the digital disimpaction of the maxilla and if the patient is unconscious then you're going giving this endotracheal intubation this is all about the airway with the cervical spine control and about the breathing and ventilation now, for example, if the cervical spine, it is like fractured, then how you can recognize it? So there are this cervical spine fracture. It can be identified using the six cardinal signs of cervical cord injury. First is the flaccid extremities. So the extremities, it will be flaccid. There is diaphragmatic breathing. So the person of this fracture, he has this diaphragmatic breathing. Then ability to flex the forearm, but it, the patient, he cannot extend it. 
then there is facial grimace in response above but not below the clavicles so the patient so the facial expression he can give the facial expression above the clavicle but not below it so there is hypotension with evidence of hemorrhage and there is the next is the circulation with the hemorrhage control so the initial step in managing hemorrhage is to minimize the blood loss by controlling any obvious bleeding and minimize or to prevent the shock so tachycardia it is the earliest measurable clinical sign because in the early stages the circulatory response to the blood loss in the progressive is like progressive vasoconstriction of the cutaneous visceral and the muscle circulation to preserve the blood flow to the kidney heart and the brain so we have studied all about so all about this physiology have, we have already studied about it so the correction of this it requires adequate oxygenation ventilation and the fluid resuscitation so the hemorrhage it is best controlled by the direct pressure on the bleeding points via dressing bandage or the manual pressure so in this the intravenous access is necessary and it is essential with the large bone intravenous catheters so when the bleeding has been controlled the lost fluid it must be replaced so ideally the patient he should be given whole blood that has been properly like typed and cross match so during the initial food man initially during the fluid management the vital signs they are assessed while monitoring the blood pressure pulse urinary output and the central venous pressure so this is all about the circulation then if the patient he has epistasis that is the nasal bleeding of some degree then it can be because of the injury to the central middle third of the face it usually stops spontaneously or it is easily controlled by packing the nose through the anterior nasal using the ribbon gauze which is soaked in the saline or the adrenaline and it has this 1 is to 1000 strength but only problem with adrenaline is the rebound hemorrhage and the last is if there is profuse hemorrhage into the nasopharynx from the terminal branches of the maxillary artery and it is associated with lefort 1 2 and 3 fractures and this may be life threatening both from the point of view of actual blood loss and the obstruction to the airway so in this a post nasal pack is needed in such extreme situations so this is all about the circulation with the hemorrhage control the next is the disability and the neurological status so after the establishment of the airway and the stabilization of the cardiovascular system neurological examination is done to evaluate the level of consciousness so those patient who arrive in a unconscious state or more importantly those patient who arrive alert and then they become unconscious they should receive a rapid neurological assessment so to assess the patient's level of consciousness this is a mnemonic that is the avpo a is if the patient is alert or if v is if the patient he responds to vocal stimuli p is if the patient he is responding to a painful stimuli and u is unresponsive so about this like i have covered assessment of a conscious level by that glasgow coma scale i have already covered about it and that coma scale it comes in this disability and the neurological status with the help of that coma scale we like can detect how severely the injury has occurred to the head so this is about the disability and the neurological state the next is the exposure and the complete examination of the patient the clinician he should know the cause of the trauma which will alert him or her regarding the type of injury for example if the trauma it is caused due to sharp objects it may result in penetrating injuries to the nerves and vessels so if there is a blunt trauma it most likely results in the fracture of the facial skeleton so in that quick and helpful examination or information can be obtained from the patient or his or her attender a mnemonic that is helpful in the immediate assessment of the patient is ample that is the allergies m is for medications p is for past illness l is for last meal and e is for events which is preceding the injury so allergies you are going to ask if the patient is allergic to something medication if that patient is taking any medications right now p is if the patient he had any past illness last meal is now it is necessary to enquire about the patient's last meal for two reasons first is the alcoholic drink it causes altered sensorium and this so this gcs so in that case the coma scale it is not applicable and it decreases the gut mobility and the tendency to vomit during the trauma it contra contraindicates the general anesthesia so therefore nasogastric suction and techniques to prevent vomiting and aspiration during intubation and anesthesia must be employed in the traumatized patient 
and e is the events which is preceding the injury because of what did injury occur so this is all about the exposure and the last is the complete examination of the patient so in that you are going to examine the oral cavity and the extraoral cavity so the oral examination it occurs in all these steps that is soft tissue nerves skeleton and dentition and the maxillofacial examination is soft tissue nerves and skeleton and about that i have already covered in the last video like what all you have to examine properly to like diagnose what exactly the trauma is so this is all about the emergency management and the preliminary examination and after that now we are going to start with the definitive management of the leaf foot so i have already covered about the leaf foot so this emergency management it is irrespective of what the trauma case is so you have to do this emergency management without actually diagnosing what the case is but you are doing it if there is any life threatening condition in that patient and after that the patient is stabilized then you start with your like you have done the examination then you have diagnosed the case and then you start with your definitive treatment and then i'm going to start with the definitive treatment for leaf foot 1 2 and 3 because i have already covered about the fracture lines and the clinical features for them so this is all about it thank you so much